Thank you, Brian. And uh, yeah, my name's Roy Anderson, and I'm here to, to talk about the supply of lumber for CLT manufacturing. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to take a real quick second to uh, thank Craig and Arnie and, and uh, Tom and Stacy, the folks at Forest Business Network, and all of their partners for putting on this conference. Um, Craig, I've known Craig Rawlings for uh, close to 15 years, and he, he talked to me about a year ago with the idea of putting on this conference, and I encouraged him to do it. And uh, I'm just amazed that there's, you know, over 500 people have, have come. And so um, I think that's great for the future of CLT. Uh, I do a lot of consulting with forest products businesses, so I'm, I'm very happy that uh, there's potentially a nice new market out there for lumber manufacturers. And uh, I just wanted to start by, by saying thanks to Craig. Uh, the other thing I want to do before I get into my presentation is just give you a quick rundown about the Beck Group. That's a company that I work for. It was started in 1981 by Tom Beck. Uh, he's still working at the Beck Group, but he's, he's pretty close to retirement. Um, but he was the founder of the company. We provide uh, consulting and planning services to the forest products industry. We work in a lot of different sectors. Um, pretty much everything except pulp and paper. Um, and then we also have pretty broad geographic area where we work in pretty much everywhere in North America. And then uh, once in a while we do overseas projects. And in fact, right now we're uh, working on the planning of a new sawmill down in South America. So uh, we work in a lot of different places and we're based right here in Portland, Oregon. So that's uh, a quick note about the Beck Group. Um, so like I, like I said, I want to talk about the supply of lumber for making CLT. And really the first point I want to make is um, just offer you a perspective on how much it costs to make different for types of forest products. And uh, that's what this chart shows here. It's the percent of manufacturing costs by different natural expenses. Uh, and where it says wood, you should also really just label that as raw material. Um, but where that data comes from is, is probably what we're best known for at the Beck Group. We do benchmarking studies in different sectors of the forest products industry. And uh, the way those work is that we recruit firms to participate in the study. Uh, and once we get, usually it's about a dozen actual plants to, to agree to be in the study, and they pay us to participate in the study. Um, they basically open their books up to us, and we gather very detailed information about their operations in terms of their costs, um, their sales realizations, what their staffing levels are, what their productivity is. Um, you know, pretty much the thing we say is if you're managing one of those operations and there's something you should be paying attention to, we try and collect that information in our benchmarking studies. We compile all of that information into a report and then we meet with the top level managers at the different companies and they, they can see where they uh, stand relative to all of their competitors. So that's where all this data comes from. It's, it's uh, you know, real, real numbers from real companies. And it, it, it uh, I believe it represents, uh, you know, what it, it's, it's uh, I believe it's a good representation of actual manufacturing costs. Uh, the one caveat that, to that, though, is CLT. Uh, we have never done any benchmarking studies in CLT. So it, that, that column is just, uh, you know, our estimated buildup of the cost of CLT manufacturing. But uh, as you can see, CLT uh, is second highest in terms of wood as a percentage of your overall manufacturing cost. So the real takeaway on this slide is, is uh, you know, wood is a big part of your cost and, and you better have a pretty good understanding of, of uh, where it's going to come from and how much it's going to cost you if you're going to be making, making CLT. Um, okay, so that's kind of the cost perspective, but then I also want to start digging into the supply of, of um, lumber that's out there. And this chart, if you look at the uh, 
the bottom line there, it shows you the amount of lumber that's been consumed in the United States over the last 10 years. And uh, you can see that back in 2006, it was one of the, um, one of the, I think one of the, historically one of the highest years of lumber consumption. 2005 might have been a little higher, but it was about um, a little over, almost 61 billion board feet of lumber consumed. We had the big downturn in the economy. And uh, during 2009, it was basically half the amount of lumber consumed. And for the last few years, we've been going back up. Um, not quite as fast as a lot of people would like in the forest products industry, but at least we're heading the right direction. So um, that's, that last slide was just kind of overall, I want to start zeroing in a little bit on different regions. And if you look um, you know, in the area that's highlighted there in red, that shows the production in the west and in the south, and then every other part of the U.S. gets lumped into other. But uh, just historically, the U.S. west and the U.S. south have been fairly even in terms of the amount of lumber that they produce. But as we've come out of the downturn in the economy, the south has kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Um, I believe there's two reasons for that. One, out here in the west, a lot of the land is, is more publicly owned, and so competition for logs is uh, fierce because there's not as much timber being harvested from public lands. And so there, I believe there's some supply constraints. And then in the south, what's happened over about the last 10 years is that there's been a lot of Canadian companies that have bought up smaller sawmills down there that might have been like uh, family owned operations where they had one or two mills. And uh, these bigger, these Canadian companies are uh, more heavily capitalized, and I would say take more of a uh, you know high production approach to running those operations. So I think you're starting to see that there. But the point I want to make about this is that uh, last year the Beck Group did a feasibility study for making CLT panels, and uh, the the manufacturing plant that we modeled would consume 24 million board feet of lumber a year, and that was if it was going to be run on a two shift basis. So if you look at um, you know, the 14 billion board feet of lumber that was produced in the West, um, you know, and just do the math there, theoretically at least you'd have enough lumber to supply 600 CLT plants like that. But what I want to do in the next, the rest of the presentation is start digging into the details on that and, uh, and see if there really is, you know, that massive amount of lumber out there that, that could be used for making CLT. So, um, like I said, that's what I want to do is start digging into the details of the supply. And I think to understand uh, the supply situation, you also need to understand what the lumber specifications are if it's going to be used for making CLT. So I want to talk about a few of those in terms of uh, the species and the grades. Um, size and moisture content. So that's what the next few slides are about. Um, first of all, regarding species, uh, and this comes straight out of the, the American uh, Panel Association, APA. They've, they've developed the specifications for lumber use for CLT. Um, but any softwood species that's recognized by the American Lumber Standards Committee that has a specific gravity of 0.35 or greater is acceptable. And so all of those species you see on the left-hand side are uh, okay for use in CLT manufacturing. The ones on the right-hand side, uh, the specific gravity is too, too low, so they're not accepted. Um, and then the other thing about species is when you're laying out the CLT panels, you can only use one species per layer. It's okay for the, uh, you know, the adjacent layers to be different species, but in a given layer, it, it has to be just one species. Or kind of a nuance on that is when lumber is actually sold, uh, a lot of times it gets lumped into species groups, like Douglas fir and larch is often sold as, sold as fir larch, or hemlock and white fir is sold as, as a species group hemp fir. Uh, I believe those species groups uh, can be used in a, in a single layer as well. 
But uh, the point is you've got some limitations based on species. Then you've got grades to consider. Um, structural lumber is graded in two ways. One is just visual grading, and that, you know, that used to be done a lot by humans, but mostly now it's, it's uh, machines that do that. They scan the lumber and assign it to a grade. And then there's also uh, machine grading where basically the, the lumber is, is bent and then based on its stiffness to the bending, it's assigned a, a grade. Um, but if you're, if you're talking about the parallel layers of a CLT panel, and I've, my next slide shows what I mean by parallel and perpendicular layers, but in the parallel layers, uh, you've got to use a number two or better grade lumber. If it's visual graded or uh, if it's machine graded, it's 1200F or better. And then in the perpendicular layers, you can use a lower grade of lumber. Uh, it's got to be at least a number three. Then there's also the issue of lumber sizes. Um, and you can't, in terms of thickness, it can't be any less than 5 eighths inch or greater than two inches. And then, like I was saying uh, on the previous slide, this you can see in this CLT panel, you've got a three-layer panel, and uh, the, you've got the two um, in the major strength direction there, the parallel uh, terminology. There's also a specification about the ratio of the width of the panel to the thickness of the lumber. And uh, in the parallel direction, it's not quite as strict. It's, the, the ratio has to be 1.75. But then in the uh, perpendicular direction, it's got to be three and a half. And so um, I, I'm not an engineer or an architect or anything like that. But my basic understanding of the reason for that is if you use pieces that are too narrow uh, in this perpendicular layer here, um, there's a chance that those pieces could kind of roll or shift. And so they, they need to be wider. Um, so there's that to think about. And this, this chart here kind of shows um, you know, the, the sizes. It lists a lot of different thicknesses and widths of lumber. And the ones highlighted in red are the uh, sizes that you, you cannot use for CLT manufacturing. So there's some limitations there. And then one last thing just in regard to specifications. You've got moisture content. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are, know all about this, but uh, you know, wood shrinks and swells as it, as it dries or gains wa uh, moisture. And so the specification for CLT is that it has to be dried to 12% moisture content. And um, that's something that has to be taken into consideration as well. So, um, that's kind of the parameters that you're dealing with if you're going to use lumber to make, or the, if you're looking at your supply of lumber to make CLT. So um, I wanted to just go through that so everybody understands what those are. And in the next few slides, I'm going to start uh, looking at how much lumber is actually available in, in light of uh, all of those parameters, and then also when you start thinking about the cost of lumber. So if you, if you think about the CLT manufacturing process, the lumber comes in in a, in a unit, and uh, in, the, in the one plant that I've been in where it's being made, it's, uh, it's the, the major defects are taken out of the lumber at a chop saw, and then the lumber's finger jointed, and so you've got this basically continuous piece of lumber coming out of the finger joiner, but then it's also cut to length again. And just say, for example, you're going to make a 10 foot by 40 foot panel. You know, in the long direction, you'd need a lot of pieces that are 40 feet long, and then in the cross direction, you need um, pieces that are 10 feet long. So you have that cut to length, a second cut to length, uh, or a, a cross cut operation there. And then uh, you also have some surfacing that happens. But all of that is a linear process. And um, the bigger the pieces are that are going through that linear process, the more uh, productive you are and, and, in turn, the lower your costs are. So that's always an important thing to remember in any linear process. 
And then uh, you get to the, the part of laying up the panels, and that's what we're showing, and I'm showing in this slide here. You can see here um, you've got the, the parallel direction, the long pieces of lumber have already been lay, laid down. Um, this guy's pulling lumber off of a forklift, and uh, it's the perpendicular direction. They're laying down the pieces. But the same thing applies here, bigger pieces, uh, less layup time, and again, lower cost. So, um, you know, if you look back over time at the history of lumber prices, that's what I'm showing here. Uh, this is the cost in dollars per thousand for um, kiln dry Douglas fir in the coast region. And it's for number two and better, random length, and it's the price that they, the sawmill gets at their plant. And you can see there's quite a bit of variability when you, when you look at the different widths of lumber. Um, but if you, if you take the averages over time, there's a fa fairly significant difference in that uh, two by eight is consistently the lowest cost uh, width. And um, bear with me one second here. There's one point I wanted to make sure I made about that. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, I guess. You know, going back to my original slide when I showed that a little over half of your total manufacturing cost for uh, CLT is the cost of wood, you know, I would argue that you want to make sure you're buying the lowest cost uh, lumber that you can that still meets all of, the, all of the specifications that I went through. So from here, uh, looking at this data, you know, you... You would, you would pick two by eight, but then you also have this other issue that I was talking about of if, if you start using smaller, narrower pieces, your productivity goes down and then your cost goes up. So I guess our conclusion is that kind of the best uh, compromise of all of those things is to try and target two by eight lumber and uh, aim at that. So with that in mind, uh, Again, using going back to our benchmarking data, this is from a study that we did of Western Dimension Mills in 2013. There was 13 mills in that study, and of all of the lumber that they produced, 11% was two by eight. Uh, pretty heavy to two by four and two by six. You know, almost uh, getting close to 70% two by four and two by six, and not as much wides. So 11% of your lumber is two by eight, and then in terms of grades, remember you need number two or better, uh, at least for the parallel uh, layers. 49% of the lumber was number two and better. So what does that mean in terms of your supply? The average sawmill in our study produced 180 million board feet of lumber a year, and uh, on average, 54% of that lumber was, was Douglas fir. And I, w I would argue that if you're gonna make CLT, you wanna keep your manufacturing process as simple as possible, and uh, you would wanna try and stick to one species. And so, uh, you know, you could debate that, but just assuming you were targeting one species, if 50% of the volume produced is Douglas fir, then that cuts your 180 million feet down to 97 million board feet. And then if only 11% is two by eight, uh, then you're down to 10.7 million board feet out of that 180. And then of that, if only 49% is number two and better, then you're at about 5.2 million board feet out of that 180 that really is perfectly dialed into all of your specifications. So, um, you know, if going back to the, the theoretical plant that uses 24 million board feet a year, you'd need to be pretty close to five different sawmills to get the perfect material that you're looking for.
Um, some other things to think about, you know, right now the current standard practice in the industry is to dry your lumber to 19% moisture. And uh, it's roughly takes about 24 hours to do that. But, uh, you know, if you're gonna go to 12% moisture, that takes a longer time to do that. I, I didn't take the time to research exactly how much, so I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes twice as long. Because the one thing I know about lumber drying is, is uh, the more moisture you remove, the harder that wood tends to hold on to the moisture and the more energy it takes. So it's, it's not a straight line relationship. So I, I expect it would take a fair amount longer to get it to 12%. And then it's not true for every sawmill, but for a lot of sawmills, their total productivity is, is uh, limited to how fast they can get lumber through their kilns. So it's the bottleneck at a lot of sawmills. And, and if you're talking about a new market where you have to slow down to take more time to dry lumber, um, that, you know, that could, could be a problem. So um, in our analysis, we've assumed that, you know, if you're going to buy your lumber, you might have to pay up to as much as a $50 premium for material that's dried to 12% moisture. Um, then you might ask the question, well, why couldn't the CLT plant dry their own lumber? That's definitely an option. But the things you need to think about there are that when the lumber comes in, it's all going to be flat packed. And uh, you'd need to receive that lumber and take it out of the bundles and get it on stickers so that you can have uh, space between the layers of lumber. That's what it shows here in this middle, middle slide um, so that the air can flow in between there and, and dry the material out. That's a very labor intensive process. Um, and then, you know, you need to invest in, invest your capital in, a, in dry kilns and you'd have ongoing operating costs for staff to run the kilns and uh, energy to, you know, produce the heat to dry the lumber. And so, um, you know, it's certainly possible that you could dry your own lumber at a CLT plant, but, you know, I, I think it would make the operation a lot more complex. And, and our conclusion is that you'd probably be, be better off uh, buying your lumber. Uh, one other thing, there's the option of using lumber that isn't two inches thick. Um, there's one, I think, kind of interesting advantage to that. And that has to do with uh, fire resistance rating. And um, again, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding of the way the testing works is if, if uh, a piece of wood is burned and then, uh, but it's not, you know, it's just charred on the outside. If you test that material after it's been burned, um, you can only use the layers in the CLT panel that haven't been affected by fire. And so if you're using a panel that has a lot of layers uh, and only the outside layers are burned, you have a bigger dimension and obviously more strength than uh, if you're using a three layer panel and, and the outside is, is affected by the fire, you've, you've got a lot smaller dimension that's not affected. So that's potentially a, a big advantage of, of uh, using thinner pieces of wood but in, in the West here, at least, um, less than 2% of the lumber that's produced is, is one inch thick. Um, and then that lumber is typically sold uh, rough, green. And, uh, and so it, what that means, if you're not familiar with that terminology, is just that it's not, it's not plain, so it's not surface, and it's not kiln dried. And uh, both of those things need to happen if it's going to be uh, used for CLT manufacturing. And then um, another thing is that we're not aware of any one inch lumber that's graded for structural uses. So it's just not a standard practice. I think it could be done, but um, I'm not aware of any, we're not aware of anyone that's doing it. And then finally, uh, like I, I pointed out in a couple earlier slides, if you're using smaller pieces, your productivity is, is less and, and so your manufacturing costs would go up. So. Um, you know, one inch lumber might be an alternative at some point, but right now it just doesn't seem to be a, a real practical solution. So uh, I guess to kind of wrap things up, um, some of the key points I was trying to make here, you know, you, I think if you're going to make CLT, you want to target the lowest cost and widest pieces of lumber that you can get your hands on. 
And I think to keep your pro process as simple as possible, you'd want to use a single species. And uh, that means that you'd need to have multiple sawmills near your CLT plant. And uh, the reason I've got this map up here, this is a, uh, a map that shows sawmills that were shut down, the purple dots, are sawmills that were shut down, I believe, between 1990 and 2003. So if you, um, if you added all the mills that have been shut down since 2003, there'd be a lot more dots on there. But um, the point is, you'd want to you'd want to you want to do a lot of analysis and, and a lot of planning to make sure you site your plant near some mills that you believe are going to be around for the long term and, and viable. Um, and then some of the other points, there's some unknowns about the ability and cost of drying lumber to 12% moisture. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't do a, a super detailed analysis of how much it would cost to dry lumber yourself, but I believe it would be pretty expensive if you were a CLT, manufa uh, CLT manufacturer and you decided to go that route. And then finally, one inch lumber might be an alternative, but it just doesn't really seem like a, a practical option right now. So that's all I had. And uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to speak. And I believe we have time for questions, right? <laughs>